Hey everybody, it is Monday, and that means another awesome person, and this week's awesome person is my very good friend, Tony Maserati. Hey Tony, how are you? Hey Andrew, good, I'm very good. Actually. Good, coming to us from Van Nuys, California, I know it well. Yeah, you sure do. <laughs> we, <laughs> we might get to that part of, of what's going on, but you're doing well, you're holding up in uh, all the craziness and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm doing really well. I, uh, I, you know, this is this is well, this will go down obviously in the history books as as the most tumultuous, socially, politically. Um, you know, it, 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 so much of this year is is packed with stuff, and and I feel like um, y you know. Certainly, in this day and age, we don't need to document anything. It's, it's out there. Right. You, know, you can Google shit, and and you can see anything in the world that you want to know about. Um, and hopefully, the the truth will get into the history books for everybody. <laughs> and all well, that. But, um, yeah, we'll see it, about that. It's also a big year for me because I I we just had a baby. Yes, baby. congratulations. And you sent me a fantastic picture of you working with the baby strapped on, which I'm not going to share only because I would have to like do stuff to do that. But yeah, yeah. if you share it, people will search it. It's it's awesome. It's great. Yeah, I, I it was our first attempt at getting one of those, you know, baby slings, slings yeah. to happen, and and we were not successful. She <laughs> lasted for like, you know, ten minutes, and then started whining and was pretty pissed off at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she she has gotten to the place where um, there's only two comfortable spots. One is you know with her mom on the boob, and the other is basically in the most uncomfortable position on me. Yeah. And um, so we've tried to figure out how I can do this handling <laughs> without without breaking my back. Um, and the best part is, especially being in Southern California, that babies that age are furnaces. They're yeah. just so hot. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, they're manufacturing all the time. So it's, yeah. yeah. So you, the, the weird thing is, you know, um, the air conditioning, uh, I, I, we just used it in the daytime. And, and you know, I, I, I don't, because I'm a new dad, I've never been a dad. I'm, I have no idea how to manage a baby's heat thing. Like she hates hats. So I'm always nervous that she's cold. And anyway, what we found out is she'll be crying in the house. As soon as I walk outside, it's 100 degrees. She loves it. Right. She quiets down, goes to sleep immediately. Wow. So I, I'm sitting outside so all the time. So you just leave her, leave her outside then. Uncomfortably, yeah. you know, sweating. <laughs> and she's happy as a clam, like, on daddy, which, you know, is both – the most wonderful thing on yeah. the planet, and and then I think about my back. Well, you know, I, I'd suggest, it, as we did in that driveway, a white trash hammock is good. Oh yeah, we've we've been online looking for the yeah. proper. Yeah, and don't don't worry about what it looks like. Just get one that's on a stand that you can move easily, because then you can keep it in the shade. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, but like speaking of babies, let's talk mm -hmm. about you. Mm. Because you started out as a baby, so that's a really good segue, right? <laughs> so I know, and I kind of I, I managed to use some version of that line almost every week now because I'm like, how do you start? Well, you you started out as a baby, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But one of the things that I love to get to is kind of the path in, like where different people sort of discovered this. And it's funny that some people discovered record making as a thing, at, like at a really young age. Some people discover it later. Um, some just sort of almost happen into it. Like John Lecky, the way he describes it is he didn't really know much about it, but he got a gig at Abbey Road and then off he went. And within a year, he's producing records, but had no real knowledge of that. So, and you're, I think, sort of a more traditional way in. Um, but can we can we start at the, the only... at the beginning just to get your sort of love of music in there? Because that that is something that everybody who does this seems to have had from a very young age. Very few people are like, oh yeah, I didn't really listen to records. Like everybody was listening to records and yeah. loved records. And I love the fact that, and maybe 
you know, this was hyperbole, but you say that your musical tastes were shaped by wanting to hate everything that your sisters liked. That's true. I was just going to say that. That's so funny. <laughs> um, no, no, it, my sisters, I had older sisters. And of course, the Beatles, the Stones were their favorite. The Beatles, of course. Um, uh, Diana Ross. Um, so it was impossible for me not to hear those records over and over and know them intimately. But for me to be, you know, different than than my sisters, I was into, you know, more R&B type things. Um, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire um, and, uh, you know, James Brown and and uh, whatever, whatever the the R&B thing from when I was, a, you know, a preteen. Um, and I used to go down to the record store. I don't know if I, I still have them somewhere, but the record store used to have a top 40 listed. Right. On, on like a, it was almost like a bookmark, you know, it was a little thicker than a bookmark kind of thing. Like a card catalog kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a longish kind of thing and it would have the top 40 listed on there. And I collected those things from the time I was, I don't know, seven or eight. Even, wow. Because it was a thing to do and probably because my sister didn't do that. <laughs> and, um, and, and I remember, you know, thinking like, oh, I've got to, I've got to listen to all of these kind of thing. And so that was the thing like you wanted to hear everything on the top 40. Uh, did we lose you? Oh no. It's very early in the game to have uh, have technical problems like this. Hopefully Tony will be back in a moment. I will text him to let him know that he's frozen. In the meantime, I will tell you that neither of his parents uh, were, were musicians really. Apparently uh, his mom was in a glee club. His dad had one lesson on ukulele and then smashed it to bits. Um, all right, hold on. Texting the man. I could go again to the uh, we'll be back soon it just seems silly. So now you're just going to look at me really big. What else can I tell you about Tony? He grew up in Rhode Island. We didn't mention that. So just outside of Providence, a small town in uh, in Rhode Island. Um, uh, he's saying maybe his internet died, so he's just going to do that. And I will tell him that worst case, he can just come on his phone. We have uh, a couple of questions. Well, all right. We can start off with a couple of questions. Well, this, Are oh no, here? hold on. Oh no. Oh, I thought it was Tony coming in. All right. Oh, hey, Mark. Hey, um, let's see here. So let me find a question that does not require the Tony. And you just keep an eye out in the waiting room. Yeah. Well, here's a random one. Have you ever built a PC for audio production? A PC, yeah, I did actually. Like back in the day, I'd say '95 or '96, uh, when Sony Acid was the only program that now they all do. But it's it was Ableton, and it was only on Windows, and so that's where my loop library was. So yeah, I had this weird rack mount PC thing that wow. ran that. Yeah, I I couldn't tell you any of the specs. I have no idea. So yeah. Yeah, it, uh, we had somebody asking if you have any tips for do's and don'ts on building your own PC for audio production. No, not really. And I've been really intrigued by the whole Hackintosh thing, too. Um, like, there are yeah. videos online of somebody running one of those 64-core uh, Ryzen processors, and it boots the OS, but I have a feeling Pro Tools wouldn't be happy right. about that. Yeah. Um, and I think Tony's coming back. Is he? Hi. Uh, oh. I'm trying here. That was kind of weird. Yeah. I have no idea what happened other than maybe we had a power failure. Uh, um, hold on. My Zoom is here, but I don't. Well, we hear you, but we don't see you. Zoom video. So now I'm on my phone. Trying to send you a prompt for the video. Let's see it. Oh, oh here he comes. 
Yeah. It's very dark. <laughs> Let me get get. Uh... Oh, nothing like live internet, huh? Is that there you are. Hey. All right, guys. Is that working? Yep. I don't see y'all, so. Oh, uh, that's a shame. Sure. Oh, there I see you. Okay. Well, and I think okay. Mark's going to sign Wonderful. off. So basically, I just got through a little bit of uh, the fact that you grew up just outside Providence, Rhode Island. Your parents didn't play music, but your dad smashed up a ukulele. So we're good, right? That takes care of your parents pretty much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my sisters didn't didn't uh, play any instruments. I didn't play any instruments until, you know, until I was uh, in high school. But the see, I, like I want to ask you about that a little grade. bit though, because that's a little weird for that time. Because I think you were in school probably like a couple years ahead of me. But yeah. like we, I was lucky we had a really good music department in our schools. But every school kind of had a music department, and it seemed sort of normal that yeah. fourth or fifth grade you'd at least take an instrument for a couple of years and. Stuff. So you didn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't. Um, and, and I don't think it had to do with d money. Uh, I, you know, my folks didn't have a lot, but I think in those days you could rent. The yeah, exactly. You'd get it for like 20, 20 bucks a year or something. Yeah. 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 So I don't think it had to do with that. I think it just, uh, maybe my parents just didn't want me <laughs> making yeah. noise. Yeah, well, I wanted to play drums, and my parents said, you're going to play French horn. Like, oh, right, yeah. okay. But I wonder, was yeah. part of it, you think that maybe it wasn't, because they weren't offering, like, rock band instruments. You had to be playing a symphonic yeah. band instrument of some description. Are you just not interested in that, maybe? or You know, I, it's, a, it's funny. I just don't remember. I remember the folks, the kids, because, you know, the kids who did play. Yeah would be carrying their instrument on those days that they had practice and things like that. And, um, and, and, you know, when people started doing that, it wasn't like you were an adolescent. So it wasn't like they were in band and you didn't want to hang out with them or something, you know, some sort right. Of <laughs> that didn't happen until later. <laughs> it didn't happen until later, but I don't, I don't remember exactly what that right. was Just... other than the fact that my folks didn't, promote it right um, right just into other stuff yeah and um yeah it was a weird thing and 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 uh yeah i don't know why i, I didn't start playing until i was in high school and I, and I basically you know had some used guitar that my folks got me that you know the action on it was like you know a couple inches high and it was <laughs> so like, like a silver play. tone or something it wasn't even that cool. You know, oh, right. Not even Sears. You know. Yeah, <laughs> it was who knows what. Yeah. Although Sears was was the uh, department store that my parents, you know, shopped at. That's funny. But, um, it, yeah. And um, there were the cool thing was that we we in high school, Mr. Pratt was his name, the the, you know, the music teacher. He was just the greatest music teacher. And that really was another, you know, part of what made the whole thing work for me. Right. Um, is Mr. Pratt was just such a nice guy. So when you, you know, took up it, guitar in high school, that was in part of, that was with the music department then. That wasn't just on your own jamming with friends. No, I started jamming with um, my friend Rick Vitato was his name. And he lived on the next street over and he actually knew how to play and showed me some chords and helped me figure things out. But then Mr. Pratt, I think, you know, just knowing that that uh, music was was sort of becoming something that people wanted to do that was not symphonic. So you know, of course, Mr. Pratt was an amazing musician and can play probably every instrument and had perfect pitch and all of that kind of stuff. He put together like a guitar class. That's and awesome. That must have been, you know, I don't know, my sophomore year. I mean, something. so we're talking like early to mid mid 80s. 
Oh, it was before that, but you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we're, that's what we're talking. We're talking. I mean, that's that's really yeah. progressive for a music teacher to do because they're overworked as it is, yeah. and to say that you know he really wants to get because like when I was in high school, you know, you had the Zeppelin camp, and they were not in the music department they were smoking cigarettes out back but they loved music and that's what they were playing and there wasn't we had a great music department but there wasn't really any attempt to sort of get them to be part of it so Mm -hmm. that's awesome that he did that yeah it was really cool and 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 in fact although he had obviously things that we had to learn how to play he would also always say to us you know learn a song that you like and come in and play and i and i remember playing like cat stevens and right you know and 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 i don't even remember you know uh uh, peter frampton and and things like that you know and and even though i'm sure i was horrible at at changing chords and everything he was always so helpful and 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 never you know never made me feel bad about it which was super cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and I remember later in my later years after I had, uh, started going to Berkeley, I had gone in to see him and, and thanked him for being so cool with us, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, Um, to go from not playing anything at all to picking up a guitar in high school and then less than five years later, you're admitted to Berkeley as a guitar performance major yeah i mean that's pretty badass yeah, yeah i was never very good and well, that's why i became an engineer but yeah but it was really really nice because i think um you know also in i went to college before berkeley and and lived with a guitar player um who just called me and left me a message as a matter of fact mike mcgovern and um and and he was actually a really good guitar player. So, you know, I, I learned a lot. I didn't realize, you know, even until I became a real engineer, I didn't realize, actually, I take that back. Maybe maybe when I got to Berkeley and, and saw some of the, those, you know, those virtuoso oh, guys. Oh, God, yes, yes. Who, who we all know them now as professionals, um, who really they didn't even need to practice. They could pick up anything. You know, you'd see, uh, you know, I think maybe like Greg Wells is that kind of person. You know, you can just sit in an instrument and just start playing. And you're like, and you've seen kids do that too. Like I've I've witnessed, you know, kids just sitting and like, oh yeah, let me figure this out. And like, they're all of a sudden playing an awesome bass line, you know, that you're like, okay, yeah, this is why I don't do this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, before we, I, I want to get to your transition from guitar player to engineer. But before we do that, I want to get to your transition from Northeastern to Berkeley, because mm. when you went to Northeastern, had you picked a major? Because as far as I can tell from my research, mm. the only two careers you were even considering at that point were attorney and professional hockey player. That's right. That's <laughs> I went to Northeastern. Because I wanted to be on the hockey team to play hockey. Because because Northeastern had a, a you know a fairly good in the Northeast hockey team, and um, my aspiration was to be on the 1980 Olympic hockey team. Oh, see, and, and that that would have the, been the year to do it. <laughs> the 1980, yeah, um, and and I was a walk on. They call it. Um, right because of course i I wasn't uh, i wasn't uh, and um so so i was a walk-on i tried out i made it to the last day wow if you can believe it and and it was a long i mean i i i i um i trained the whole summer before that year um my first year in college and i walked on and and I was in trials. I, I mean, we used to have to run around the Fenway and do all this stuff. And, and I did really well. And on the last day of, of trials, I went down, you know, did, did like the Bobby Orr style, block the, block the slap shot, you know. And, 
and my stick was out in front of me and unfortunately the puck hit my stick went right into my mouth <sighs> and um, and split my lip and and it, you know it was no big deal by that point in my life i had been hit by lots of pucks and had lots of stitches and lots of yeah. things happen to me so i got on the bench and and i was like you know the, they had like a doctor of course like a teen doctor and I was like, um, yeah, just, just butterfly that some bitch up. Let's let's keep moving here. You know, and he he looked at me and he was like, no, nah, that's not going to work. Of course, I couldn't see myself. Right. Um, so he was like, no, nah, that's not going to work in this case. So I was like, yeah, we're going to. He So he said, you're going to have to go and get this fixed. And I was like, no, no, no. Let me just, you know, let me finish out here. Wow. He was like, no, no, you got to You got to go to the hospital and get that fixed up. And of course, when I went back into the locker room, I had my mouth closed, but I could still see my teeth. So that's how <laughs> wide open this wow. thing was. And uh, and then I and I went to the hospital, got stitched up. As soon as I got out, out of the emergency room, I went back to the ice rink, and of course, it's all closed up. And the, the coach was there, and I was like, you know, I just got back, blah blah blah. And, and I was like, you know, just checking to see if I if I made the cut. And the and the coach was like, Nah, I'm sorry, you didn't make the cut. And and I and I took it pretty well. And I was like, Okay, you know, what are you gonna do? I gave it my best shot. That's for damn sure. And and I and I marked that day actually as a as a major turning point in my life. Wow. I I never looked back. And you stayed at Never. Northeastern. I mean, you didn't ditch the place because yeah. you didn't make the team. You were there for almost the four years it would have taken to graduate, yeah. right? Yeah, it was a five-year school because they had co-op. Oh, right. So that's the other part. So I started working, you know, they would do, your first two two years were full, you know, semesters. And then after that, you would do a semester in your field. So I worked at an AG's office, um, which was horrible, you know, right. at, as a young idealistic person, it was pretty difficult. Right. Um, and then I worked at a corporate law firm, firm downtown Boston, Bowker Elms. So you were doing full on pre-law then you were just pre-law. Yeah. That was it. That's yeah. what you were going to do. Yeah. And, and I, and I, in, in the AG's office, I watched the, you know, the, um, uh, the prosecutor just, it was tough. I mean, it's a tough life because, you know, those, those guys are, are just trying to do the best they can in a really difficult situation with very little resources. And then going to a corporate law firm and watching, you know, the partners basically work for five hours a day and the associates work for, you know, 20 hours a day. And I was like, wow, this is, this is fucked up, you know? Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, it was good. It was, it was great, actually, you know, to, to Northeastern really showed me like, yeah, I don't want to be a lawyer, you know? Although wow. now I think, yeah, maybe it would have been a good idea. <laughs> and but, so um, I love that, that your decision when you said, okay, I'm not going to do that. And you'd obviously decided, well, I'm going to be a guitar player instead was to go to school and not like, that's it. Going to get in a band, going to be famous. So what, why, why did you decide? Was it just that academics were a big part of your life and you knew you'd do that? Or you just felt like you were a bit behind from starting so late? Like, why did you decide to, to embark on another? Because Berkeley is four years as well, right? Yeah. So to embark on another full on college experience. Yeah, I, you know, Berkeley, um, Ber for one, it was right up the street. I mean, Boston is full of colleges. And at that time, life was, you know, was awesome. I mean, it was just great. Walking around Boston was, was phenomenal. And Boston as a city is perfect for a student um, in those days. I don't, I, don't, I don't actually know what it's like now. Um, but, you know, I could live, I could work at the, the bookstore on Boylston Street and pay my rent on, on um, Westland Avenue um, and, um, 
and eat at the the Acapulco Mexican restaurant across the street every day. Right. So like why mess that up with real life? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, and, and, um, you know, so I, I, yeah, I got into Berkeley because of my, my guitar teacher, um, really helped me do what I needed to do to, to get in. And, and, um, and that was, it was, that was perfect. It was great. But immediately, as soon as I got there, I was like, whoa, <laughs> these folks are serious. And, you know, to be around, to be around that level of professionalism was pretty amazing. Right. Um, so, and, and just the, the level, not just professionalism. I mean, these people were, were amazing, amazing musicians and just virtuoso talents. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was, and I, I had been there and I accelerated. I didn't stop. So I didn't take summers off or anything like that. I just, just bowled right through it. And I met, I met a bunch of people who were um, more techie as well. Right. And as a job, I started doing live sound to make money. Um, and I started recording people, you know, just live bands and things like that. And just making it yeah. up, just like figuring out how to do it. Totally. No yeah, friends with studios whoever. or nothing. No, nobody had that kind of dough. You know, studios in those days. Yeah, we're commercial. Were, it that was, was it. It was expensive. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I had, I had a really, really good teacher who was a friend as well. Um, um, Chris. And I feel horrible about forgetting his life. It'll come. Uh, yeah, it'll come. Um, but um, he he was a guitar player, really great guitar player, and and just a real geeky kind of you know checky guy. And um, he was the kind of guy who you know he would change out his his pickups and his guitar, you know, just for the night. <laughs> And, I, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he was the kind of guy who, who, uh, um, he would, he would know the difference between, um, a, a cable, you know, right. a good cable and a bad cable, a good connector and a bad connector. I mean, those simple things I had never even thought of, you know, I mean, when I was tinkering with recording, onto my cassette when I was in high school, you know, I was going to Radio Shack and just whatever worked. Exactly. I didn't care about the impedance and, 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 and shit like that. Um, Chris Rival was his name. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Chris knew impedance. He knew how to use a meter, you know, all these kinds of things that I was just, you know, I didn't know anything about that stuff. Right. Um, so, so he kind of turned me on to some good practices, although I never, never got to be as good as him in that technical aspect. But um, you've, you've done all right, though. I think you're good. But, <laughs> but you made kind of the formal transition, right, while at Berkeley from the yeah. performance program into the engineering program. Yeah. Which had just started yeah. there, right? Yeah, I had just started, and and I I lived in a boarding house on Symphony Road. I don't even think it's there anymore, but um, I lived in a boarding house with with folks from all different countries. There were Iranian dudes. There was um, uh, people from around the world, uh, Chinese guys who didn't speak any English, um, Palestinian dudes. It was it was an incredible experience, and I was very very lucky to have it. Um, but um, uh, I had a friend from Norway who lived in the in the boarding house with us, and um, we used to practice together. And one day, his name is Tron Cabo, and one day he we were practicing, and he just stopped, and he was like, you know, you should go into the uh, production and engineering program at Berkeley. And I was like, well, I, you know, I'm in composition. I want to be a, I want to be a writer, performer, blah blah blah. 
And he was like, yeah, I know. He was like, you're not getting any better. You know? <laughs> Norwegians like, are such dicks, aren't they? <laughs> you know what? No, he wasn't. I'm he completely kidding. Lot. For the two people yeah. from Norway watching, completely kidding. Mm -hmm. a lot of, I have a lot mm -hmm. of Norwegian friends. <laughs> he would, you know what? He taught me so many things, this guy, Tron. But, you know, he was being completely honest. He was yeah. right. I sucked. I mean, sucked horribly <laughs> comparatively to anyone who wants to be a professional. And But his point was, and he said this as well, he was like, you know, you're not getting any better, but you're really good at recording and you should do that. That's what you should do. You should go in and, and learn that. And I literally the next day went downstairs to where they were building studios and there were people like putting in equipment. And I was like, how do I get into this program? <laughs> you know, they, they just showed me and told me what to do. And so, next thing you know, I'm in that program. So up until then, then, I mean, you were always tinkering and always trying to record and doing the live sound and things like that. But it, had it not really occurred to you to do it as a career or like what was the kind? Because it seems like a bit of a light bulb went on when Tron said that, like, oh, right, I could do that, which hadn't. Didn't, didn't know it was a career. Right. Didn't, you like know, someone's I making mean, those records, but yeah. Uh, you know, I, I used to read the liner notes. Yeah. And and in fact, here's here's a really no, another interesting thing. One of my favorite records, you know, I, right before we broke, before the Internet went down on my computer, um, I was saying that I, I, I started understanding audio when I when I got my first pair of headphones. And it was one of those big, giant headphones with the little volume. knob. Right. And shit. Yeah. The cost um, something or others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but. You know, I used to love listening to the audio and was amazed by what that sounded like. And one of my favorite records was this record called Chicago at Carnegie Hall. And, and this guy, Terry Kath, was the leader of Chicago in those days. He was kind of jazzy. And, um, and it was my first exposure to jazz. I didn't really get, get into jazz too much. Um, and... Um, uh, and the guy who recorded that record was Don Palouse. Right. And, and Don Palouse was the first chair of the music production and engineering program at Berkeley. So there's, there's that connection that happened as well because I knew his name. Because right. I read line, liner notes on the records. So that kind of pushed it even further but I didn't understand that there was really a career, a career, you know, right. to me, the doing live sound was like, you know, you did it for beers. Yeah. You didn't get money for it. No. And the engineering beers. thing, I mean, in terms of school, because um, again, about the same time when I was going to college, there was Berkeley was a four year program and Miami was a four year program. And that was That's it right. in the entire country. There was That's no right. other four-year program where you could major in recording. And even at Miami, it was a music performance major with a minor in electrical engineering, but you had a bunch of recording classes. So Berkeley was really it. There were a bunch of, like you know, two-year schools, but yeah. So you wouldn't know, would you? <laughs> you, you wouldn't if you were, you know, if you were, if music was just a sort of makeshift, casual you know, I mean, I did, I did one real gig, you know, at, at the cask and flagon by that point in my life, I had been at a, you know, done a gig at a bar, you know, and, and we didn't, I don't think we got paid money, you know, I, I don't, I don't even know if we got beer, you know, it was just, you know, but I would go to gigs all the time and completely, try to hang out with the engineer and try to ask him if he needed help and shit right. like that. Um, and I remember seeing a lot of, a lot of artists that I truly dug in those days and got close because I was willing to offer my help for free. Right. And, it, and in those days, you know, they didn't, they, they didn't no, the security the, wasn't the, the same. The yeah, so, but you never wanted to do live sound as a gig because I mean, I'm sure you saw that and realized, well, that was a thing, but that just wasn't interesting. It as interesting, it, 
you know, the the idea that it was a professional, that it was a job, it didn't, you know, it didn't make sense to me as as a job. It didn't look like a job. It looked like something you did for your friends. Right. You know, <laughs> it didn't. Right. So you're assuming a, that the that the guy at the arena like might have gotten some beer. <laughs> but yeah, because yeah, you don't know. You don't know anything That's when you're funny. a kid, and and you you even the biggest gigs that I would go see, you know, I mean, I remember going backstage at a at a Bruce Springsteen concert, and and that was that was the level, you know, that was in Providence at the big auditorium, and seeing the professionalism that was there. I was completely blown away because there were stage managers, there were, you know, lots of, of, of roadies and professionals, but they all look like your older cousin. And, and, or, you know, if you had an older brother, I, I didn't have an older brother, but they all look like your older cousin with long hair and a t-shirt, you know, and, and they didn't look like professionals right. you know, who were actually making a living they look like a bunch of dudes who got together and, and, you know, their, their cousin hired them or it didn't look yeah. like a job. So I didn't, that's so funny. I didn't put the two together as a job until I went to Berkeley, until I saw Don Plews, until I saw Robin Cox yelled him, who was one of my early teachers and Wayne Wadhams and, and, and some of the teachers who were there who like had a whole life, you know, they, right. yeah, they were, they had, they, they, they had long hair at some point in their careers, but, but really they wore, you know, suit and tie to teach in, and they wore, and, and to, I mean, Robin was a woman who did it. And I was like, really? I didn't know that there was a career, much less female, you know, yeah. careers. Um, and, and so, Yeah. It wasn't until I saw these right. professionals and, 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 it, and then when you actually see, you know, when you go to a gig and see professionals perform, they're performing. So you're, you're again, as a, as an audience member, you're like, ah, just a bunch of dudes, you know, I'm watching the Grateful Dead or right. whatever it is, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a bunch of dudes. You don't equate like somebody getting paid and the level of professionalism to, who they are, you know, even going to see, um, yeah, I mean, most of the gigs I went and see were, were rock bands and punk rock bands. And things right. Like that. So as far as you, you, you imagine, there's no professionalism, but, but, th but then to be in the studio to actually see a real session and to see, you know, charts and dudes who can play that fucking thing, you know, and who can change it, you know, and then there's right. a musical director, you know, or a conductor changing the part, you know, midstream and like, you know, and everybody's following, they're not missing a beat. And you're like, Oh, okay. There is, this is a profession. Right. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that. That's I knew funny. That. So it wasn't yeah. until you saw people acting professional while doing it, like overtly yeah. that you'd even know because obviously the the crew working that Springsteen gig were working their asses off, but just totally. didn't seem like it. So totally, you I mean, you were seeing them the way everybody's parents saw them, like oh, so you're going to do that until you get a job, you know? But yeah, it's yeah. funny because if you don't know, you don't. And I mean, I like my little moment was only because some friends of my parents had a son that worked in the studio, so I got to go see a studio, and that's right. like. Oh, right. But until then, yeah, if you didn't come across a stack of mixed magazines, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know, would you? Yeah. Yeah. My, my cousin, Oliver Maserati, he worked at, at uh, and taught at Miami. He was there when I was and, there. And I did not realize he was oh, your okay. cousin, which is, that's, yes, we will cousin. speak more about that. Yeah. He was, he was one of the three person faculty what, for the last yeah. two years I was there. Yeah. Total, total genius. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in every way. And, and he actually uh, was a big influence on me, again, helping me understand professionals in that business. Because again, it, it, you know, it, that was, that was an 85. Um, that, 
that I learned, you know, that there was a profession. You know, he had actually been in a studio and showed me studios. Um, so it, it was a minute right. before I before I figured it all out. And then and then I started actually getting paid to do live sound as opposed to just getting beers. <laughs> And and then and then people I did live sound for would ask me to record record things for them, and and then like I said, Chris Rival would kind of show me the ropes on, you know, fixing shit. Right. I mean, th- fixing shit was pretty much what an engineer did. That's all I ever did. I mean, you you would have to makeshift shit. Cause, cause gear in those days sucked <laughs> and, and everything was, was made, you know, there, I mean, this, the, the transition to, you know, you could, you know, buying a pre-made cable was, you know, if you were lucky. Yeah. Radio shack. Right. If they know? happened to and have was, one with the ends you wanted. Yep. Right. You know, it, it was, you made every cable you used and 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 you know even equipment was makeshift at best you know yeah Um, there was there was no i guess it's it's hard to even remember let alone if you came up later than this there was no middle class for gear there was cheap pieces of crap and there was ridiculously expensive professional stuff and that's it other than that maybe if you got a heath kit thing like you could build one cheaper and that would be okay if you were good at building but Yeah. yeah That's right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It it was a it was a, and I think, you know, I, I talk about this a lot when when I do seminars, but you know, we got to the place, and I'm sure you did the same. We got to the place where, um, you know, you could hear a noise, and know what what that problem was. You know, whether it was a whether it was the connection at the guitar, whether it was the cable, whether it was something wrong with the amp. You know what I mean? You got yeah. to a place where you started being able to to hear, oh, that crackle is coming from this or, you know, whatever it was. You got pretty good at knowing the noises. And and I and I tell my students now, like you know, I use that, you know, cause now when I'm looking for a cool sound or some kind of saturation or distortion or something, I'm saying, okay, well, what kind of distortion do I want it to be? You know, where the guitar player like would bang on the Kate on the, on the uh, connector to make it crackle just right or whatever yeah. it was, you know, there were things that, that people did in those days with bad technology that was pretty fucking amazing yeah you know um and um and now in today's world everything is you know in a software package so there's no cables involved no Um, and it generally sounds the same each time yeah it does unless you have enough imagination to sort of pull it out and say exactly what happens if i do this you know so I'm I'm conscious of the um, how much time you've got, so I, I want to because we got so much stuff to cover, and we haven't even gotten you out of college yet. So, day after college, you go to New York, you try and find a gig, you eventually get a gig at um, at uh, Sigma, yeah. right? And I just wanted you to talk a little bit because you've talked about in other interviews about, first of all, you uh, worked with Glenn Rosenstein, who was, I'm assuming he was staff there at the time or did he own it? What was his connection? Yeah. He owned staff. He was staff, staff. staff engineer. I don't know if they called him chief engineer when I first arrived. There were several people above him, but at some point he became the chief. Right. Engineer. And this, of course, again, hard for people to really understand this. All engineers yeah. were staff engineers until kind of late 80s, early 90s was when the whole freelance thing really started to take off like crazy. So right. if he's staff, it's not that he's the guy who does the crappy sessions that don't have an engineer. People are booking the studio to work with the guy because like, you did a Ziggy That's Marley correct. record with him and all kinds of stuff, yeah. right? But you also, yeah. you mentioned in an interview 
that not too long after you got in there, there was a children's television workshop gig that came in that was That's nine right. months. And with yep. Lincoln Clapp was the engineer. And yep. I wasn't, I'd heard the name, but I looked him up today. I mean, and among other things, he, I'm assuming, because he seems to be the only engineer uh, credited, he recorded Steve Ray Vaughan's Double Trouble. Like, that's, that's him. You know, I, I don't even, I didn't even know that at the time. Or maybe I did and I've forgotten it since. And you know the way credits online are. Maybe it's wrong. But, I mean, the dude made some serious oh, records. It's very possible. He was this dude, Lincoln Clapp, like he taught me so much about what I do today. Um, I mean, I was very lucky. I had like Glenn, like several other people and you know that I work under as an assistant. But because I was with Lincoln for nine months at a very early stage of my um, professional life, I, this dude, I mean, he was in that seat, you know, at least eight hours straight. I mean, he, he might get up and literally run to the bathroom and then run back to the seat. And, and I'm just, you know, I would just leave the room to a, to a point where he like was going to fire me from the gig because I left the room so much because it was relatively boring, you know, unless we had a room full of musicians they were just doing little bits with a DX7. You know, they were right. doing little interstitial bits for those who, who have done TV. What was, what was the show? Do you remember? It was called MathNet. 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 And it was, um, it was a take on, you know, Dragnet, um, where they would, they, the, the, the cast would, um, you know, uh, would, would try to solve a math problem instead of a crime. Right. You know, awesome. um, it was super, super smart, really, really smart idea. Um, and the people involved, top notch professionals. I mean, the, the main, um, I, I, and I do forget his name, but the main, uh, music, um, writer and, 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 uh, and player, um, I mean, he would just, he would have, you know, bits of music for every, every section. It's all worked out tempo wise. And in those days, no computers. So, yeah. you know, he's, we've got a click going and, and it's, you know, and he's playing it. And then eventually the musicians would come in and play on top of that. Um, and um, it was, it was an experience that, was eye-opening to watch an engineer be such a part of the music, be totally professional and on it at all times. Every mistake I did, whether it was, you know, not recording fast enough or punching or whether it was, you know, just, you know, thinking about something else, Lincoln was on it. Uh, Lincoln came from Media Sound, um, which is where, my guess is if he did do Stevie Ray, that's probably where it was done. Right. Um, but, um, but yeah, he was a consummate professional. And, and I'd suppose so much. also organizationally, just a colossal yes. amount of work and keeping track of things. And cause I mean, that's yeah. down to him completely, which means it's then down to you. That's a lot all on tape. Yep. All on tape. Yeah. Lincoln taught me so much. And, and, and to be honest, I don't know that I, I rose to the occasion. I really, you know, I was lucky that he did not fire me. And, and, and hopefully, eventually, I was able to help him. But um, I didn't realize the gravity. No, no idea. I had no idea the, the, the level at which you had to function for that much organization, you know, moving mics around because the spots are, you know, there's a 10 second spot. There's, there's a 20 second spot. We're doing 20 of them in a day. Right. And, and, uh, you know, if, if, and that means I'm running in and out or if I'm out of the room, Lincoln's running in and out, which is not good. Um, and we're, you know, we're recording two track stuff throughout the day. It's not like we we were, you know, 
it's not like a, an album that you would do a lot of recording and then do a lot of mixing. This was right. Mix it all on the fly because you're not going to come back. Yeah, you're making spots that have to be used right away. And then, and then, of course, there's the bouncing the stuff to mag and all this right. shit. Back in those days, Incredible. yeah, mag, which technically yeah. would be a really good a- a- sounding analog format. That's a lot of oxide moving pretty yeah. quick. But and you yeah. talk about the metronomes. I mean, back then, all the Yuri ones were set in frames per beat because it was all film. How many film frames per beat is it? So people wouldn't That's even be thinking in correct. beats per minute. Yeah, different. Yeah different universe really so um but you became kind of a gearhead i mean because you were always you were saying like as a kid you were taking stuff apart and you were into the equipment side of things and learning how stuff worked but then at that time that's right when midi was taking off you mentioned the dx7 i mean this is right at the beginning of the sort of revolution of midi yeah and sequencers yeah. and things like that. And that became a thing that you decided you wanted to know or you sort of needed to know it for a couple of sessions, realized you were good at it. or Because this became a big deal for your career was being the guy who could run That's the gear. That's absolutely right. So how did that come yeah. about? You know, um, in addition to to Glenn and, 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 uh, and some of the other engineers uh, that I worked with, you know, most of the, the the senior guys at the studio, they were they were recordists. You know, the term recordist was used then, um, and they were good. Um, this guy uh, Jim Doherty, I used to, I, I learned so much from sitting behind him, and and uh, um, Mike Hutchinson. Um, there there were some amazing engineers who who. You know, some were staffed, some were, were sort of, they would play different studios and, and work with the managers at different studios. Um, but they, they were recordists. They, you know, when a piece of MIDI gear came in, there was usually a guy hired to deal with that. Um, and, and, you know, if there meant, if there was connections that needed to be made, there was a guy who did that and either the keyboardist did it himself or he had a, a guy who did that Yeah, and they would set it up. So of course m- the fact that I was at a lower level, I was helping the guy set it up. Right. So I learned from those technicians how to set the shit up and what it meant. And you know, the length of the cable was a big factor and all of these kinds of things. And, um, and then there was another engineer there, younger engineer, um, older than me, but between us, um, named Don Petrkovsky, who was a complete gearhead. And, and um, he really, really helped me understand um, how to set this stuff up and, and, and how it worked. And he was the first one to expose me to computer uh, programming. Um, the thing that I did was I really learned how to use the SSL and that really helped me right. um, get into the rooms faster. So I learned, we had an MCI, we had an SSL, we had two SSLs and, um, and I really took it upon myself to learn the computers in those, those machines, but then started hanging out with Don and Don showed me how sequencers worked, whether it was a Lindrum or uh, emu or whatever the, right. the sequences were in those days and then how to link that up with the tape machine which was a huge deal because if you didn't know it was going to drift yeah. it was going to drift yeah. yeah with analog yeah. tape there's yeah. no way it was staying in sync unless you resolved it and blah 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 so yeah yeah so I, I really dug in and what, I, you know, and I've mentioned this probably in a couple of interviews, but what, what ended up happening was we used to hang out at, at the local bars and all the, the young engineers would be at a, a few of the local bars in the Midtown area. Everybody wanted to do rock. Everyone wanted to do rock. 
they all wanted the best snare drum sound. They all wanted the best drum sound. And I, of course, wanted that too. But it wasn't hard to see that, you know, there was, there was, there was beginning to be this split in electronic and acoustic engineers. And, you know, every engineer, every single one, there wasn't a young engineer or an older engineer who cared about electronic. And I was like, okay, well, I'm kind of digging this, this idea. And creatively, I had some friends who were doing it like Don and, and a couple other musician friends who were really doing it. And, and I thought, well, this, this is kind of a cool thing. And I noticed that on every session, there was electronic shit. Right. So it just, for me, it became obvious, like, okay, well, all those dudes can learn how to do a snare drum. And I'll go this way and I'll do shit that, that nobody else is doing because mostly because nobody else wants to do it. So it was almost and, a business decision more than a creative thing at that point. You know, I think too, the, the rock music in that period was hair bands. Right. For the most part. I mean, well, yeah, grunge hadn't really happened yet. Yeah, yeah. Grunge hadn't really picked in yet, come in yet. And, and punk, I was, I was a punker and, and, you know, punk was like no rules yeah so i thought no rules means any fucking thing could happen and it had kind of died out as a a genre there's a great uh interview with chrissy hind where she says the reason punk died out is because they all learned how to play so (laughs) yeah 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 and and you know the talking heads were were in the studio a lot I, i didn't do any engineering for them but i did assisting and they were really innovative guys and really smart and Jerry Harrison and, 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 you know, they incorporated lots of different things. Steve Lillywhite was, was a producer. Um, and they just, they, they didn't have rules either. And I thought that was really smart and interesting. Um, and, uh, and so it wasn't a, you know, I didn't know it was a business decision, but I guess it was a business decision. Um, but for me, it was just let's let's go with the crazy chaotic people, right? And less less formulative, and and move toward the you know what in my opinion seemed to be more creative, even though I, I didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, no, it's but, a really um, interesting take on it, though. That it's basically wanting to be working on music where you didn't know what was going to happen next. And that meant going with all the technology, which actually made things repeatable. But it meant you were going down a path that no one really knew what it was yet. So that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. And there was a there was a group that that rented the studio a lot that Glenn worked with, named Full Force, and they were six, three brothers, three cousins, and they worked together uh, on various productions of R and B at the time, and. Uh, and they also just kind of took it, you know, they didn't, they didn't conform to typical recording techniques, you know, and they explored whatever the newest giz- gizmo was. And, um, and that also helped me, you know, not only did they teach me about vocals, which I, I had no idea the depth at which you know, you could get with comping a vocal and recording a vocal and, and the harmonies and all of these kinds of things that, that generally rock bands and punk bands did not do. Um, that was, that was pretty amazing. And, and they really pushed the limits as far as the technology goes as well. Right. And some of the people I was listening to at the time, you know, I was putting together my playlist and, you know, and I reached out to Dave Way, and I was like, "Dave, which Teddy Riley records did you do?" He never, he never actually answered my question. But <laughs> you know, between him and this guy Dennis Mitchell, I used to just like they were geniuses to me. Yeah, and how they incorporated modern technology and 
you know, in those days sampling, you know, young people don't know what we went through to sample. Sampling was fucking ridiculous. Yeah. You know, catching um, it in a 2290 because that was the only thing in the studio that would do it or yeah or the ams and, yeah. and then triggering it from the sync head and getting the right to uh but you know when i listened to those guys work when i was a young engineer and, and, a, and an assistant i was blown away by what they were so doing. for the for the folks at home what are a few artists that they worked with they, Teddy Riley was was so far ahead of the curve um, as far as his right. use of technology. I meant the uh, the full force guys, like which which projects? Oh, the full were force guys. On? The full force guys worked on an artist named an artist named uh, Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam, which yeah. Glenn did did yeah. a couple of those records. Um, uh, I wonder if I take you home was was her hit and. Um, and they were also the first to expose me to what it what a production company was. I didn't really know what that was until then. But they worked on. I I mean I recorded Patty Labelle. I recorded um, I recorded um, James Brown with them. I wanted to ask you know? about this. I, so we got to hear a little bit about the James Brown because it's also one of the few people you mentioned that you listened to early on. So that must have been insane. I used to go see James Brown. I don't even remember the name of the club. I want to. I want to say it's the Iguana, but it wasn't the Iguana. It was. Well, on, we'll call it the Iguana. It, yeah, and it was on. Um, it was on on Fifth Avenue, below Twelfth, or right there on Twelfth, something like that. I used to go see him. He would play New York City like once a month, and and I would go all the time to the point where I was like, oh, you know. I would only watch a few songs. Can you <laughs> fucking imagine? I would. I went so often that I would only, you know, I'd be, ah, well, I'm going to take off and so and so. It's, you know, my friends, whatever, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, but I would go see James Brown uh, play there um, relatively often, and um, and anyway, uh, Full Force asked me to record him. And I was green as green could be at this point, you know. Uh, Glenn was working on probably Tom Tom Club in the right. other room, so he couldn't work with them on this. So he was nice enough to let me do it. I was completely green, but thank thank God for Lincoln Clap. This is where the Lincoln Clap thing comes in, right? So, um. Having seen James Brown perform, I knew that the microphone that he used live was an SM57 or 58, sorry, 58, a sure SM58. So, oh, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, your video just uh, can still hear you. There you yeah. are. Yeah, sorry about this. That's all right. We'll, we'll get the computer going again. I'm assuming my internet is back up, but, um, so, you know, of course, I'm studying James Brown before, the, you know, a week before the session is going to happen. I've got the room all set up. This is the Lincoln clap now in me. Um, and I'm ready. Um, I, I have never met James Brown. Um, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, you if you're nasty. Yeah. No, no. It's Mr. <laughs> Brown, period. You have to call him Mr. Brown. Um, but... Uh, so I put up, I think maybe three microphones, a uh, FET 47, a U87, and an SM58. And thank God I had that SM58 is all I have to say. Because James Brown dances when he sings. And you know, literally is hanging on to the music stand. Not that he needed a music stand other than just to have the lyrics in front of him. But, you know, he's banging, he's tapping, he's dancing. And so the car, the, 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 uh, the, um, the condenser mics were useless because, you know, even with a shock mount, it's, you know, yeah. it's going boom, 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 you know, and, uh, 
and the 58 was stellar you know was, <laughs> and, and he was he was comfortable it felt good for him so i that was i was like oh my god thank god i did that you know and and um but those sessions without that that lincoln clap you know machine sitting in the seat right for hours just punching punching you know without that i would not have made it through that because That's it amazing. was the hardest thing i'd ever it done. would have been so easy to go the other way too to be like man that guy's always singing on a cheap piece of crap mike i'm going to set up the good stuff for him and it's just going to be a revelation i mean because especially when you're young yeah. that's the way you think so that's yeah. pretty genius that your brain said, nope, get that 58 up. That's good yeah. going, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and it and I was lucky. <laughs> um but yeah, without that with without that Lincoln Clap, you know, machine type engineering uh determination, I would not have made it through that. I, I was a ball of nerves. I mean, when the session was over, it was just like <laughs> When the day was over, you know, but I, I did that for, I mean, it was at least two weeks, if not more, Might wow. have a whole month of James Brown every day on the MCI. Just singing. You know, just singing. I mean, you know, this wasn't James Brown at his best. He was, he was, this was later in his career. Right. So it was, it was a little more difficult than, than I think that probably his one take period you yeah. know um and uh and of course me as a fledgling engineer i'm just trying to figure it out um but but the full force guys really pulled it together and helped me do man it. that's a great place to start but you've got a credit i mean who knows when these things actually come out but you've got a uh, whitney houston credit from even before then like yes, in that was an assisting credit. That was an assisting credit, right? Um, I, 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 I was the second assistant. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you how stupid a person I am. I, you probably know this because you know me well, but I'm clueless about so many things. Whitney Houston is a girl, a young girl. I mean, she was younger than me when she was a gigantic star. And she was working downstairs with Michael Masser. And a guy named Fernando Kral was the, 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 the assistant assistant. And I, can't, I can't remember the engineer was Paul Simon's engineer. And I can't remember. Roy Haley, maybe? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah, it might have been Roy Haley. I can't remember specifically. We'll Michael say it's Mass Roy for now. Yeah. Anyway, I was the second assistant whose job it was to watch Whitney. That was my job. So I basically hung out with Whitney. She had, a, of course, a personal assistant. Yeah. Um, and, and handlers and managers and all that stuff. My job was to just keep her comfortable, whatever she needed, get it for her. Of course, the, Fernando would ask me to come in and normal a console, or, or, or you know, I would I would have to bring a new roll of tape, things like that for engineers as well. But for the most part, I hung out with Whitney while she recorded. You know, while she was waiting for them to be ready to record vocals, I just hung out with her literally right outside the studio door. And, and, and I would just be there and we would chat. I to this day don't remember anything we <laughs> chatted about because I was clueless. What was happening? This is the, the biggest star, you know, <laughs> up, up and coming at yeah. the time, of course. But, and, and, um, and she was so sweet to me. <laughs> so fucking sweet to me like you know clive davis would come in and have a meeting and she'd be like oh hold on just one sec i gotta go and talk to you know clive and i didn't know who clive davis <laughs> was you know and she'd be like totally casual like clive was what you know her her uncle kind of thing and 
And then she'd come back out and she'd be like, how you doing? And I'd be like, oh, I don't know what's <laughs> happening. And, you know, I would have to go and get her eclair. She liked eclairs. Who doesn't? And, and then, but I was also allowed in the room, not often, but a couple times when she sang. And man, I, I'm sure you have been in the room with, with some talent. That shit was oof, against the back wall when she when she blew you know, i don't even know how close she was to the fucking mic man right i mean she might have been six feet away i don't fucking know all i know is that all of us when she killed it you know we were all like the room is silent you know the tape stops the the engineering staff is like we've never seen or heard anything like this in our life even Roy Haley, who was very experienced, we were all like, you know, this is mind, you know, just that, just feeling that. Forget about the technology of what's happening inside of her throat and her, you know, whatever. You know, and, and, and even Michael Masser was like, oh, yeah, we're going we're to try one more. And I'm like, really? <laughs> You need another one of those? <laughs> that, that, you know, um, anyway, so I, I was lucky enough to be in a room with her, but I, I can't say that uh, other than learning what it means to be yeah. in a room with somebody that amazing, I don't know that I did anything other than buy her eclairs and with an ear to whatever, we, you know, we might have been talking about some TV show. Which was super important. But I think it's it's just like when you said you saw, like with Lincoln showing you like what an engineer can be and then you realize that all the guys mix in front of house, like that's actually a gig. And, and it's important. It's a really important lesson to see a performer like that yeah. in the studio and not like oh my friend's a great guitar player i mean even at berkeley it's like well they're not out in the world doing it yet you know that there's some special people there but so mm. that's a big lesson it's a big lesson to learn that someone can be on the other side of a microphone like that you know that's incredible you, you know you're you're absolutely right and and that you know as you know as an as an audience member you're like wow i'm blown away you know and you know your favorite concerts. By that point in my life, I, you know, I've got my list of my favorite concerts. And, and, but to see that, and then to see a, a room, not full of, you know, there might have been five people in the room. Right. But, but to see that, that emotional thing coming from that woman in, in the booth, hitting the five people in the other room, you know, like, like a, you know, it's slow motion, like, <laughs> you know, that also is the experience, right? To see that, because when you go see a concert, that person has done that performance like a hundred times and sure you love them. Yeah. So you love that performance. But to see this woman first time just go boom, to a whole room of professional dudes who have been in the room with huge stars, you're, you're just like, okay, there's, there's some differences between good and amazing. Yeah, there's transcendent. And yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there, and, it's, and it's not just a technical you know, thing. This is an emotional, like, you know, happening. And we, and, 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 you know, and then there's this girl out there, girl, and she was a girl yeah. who, who was just like, was that okay? And we're, all, <laughs> we're all like, uh, you know, like and of that. course this is after eating a bunch of dairy in those eclairs, yeah, which she shouldn't be exactly. having anyway. No, and she just like, you know, but then, you know, I work with Mary J. Blige and she like ate a half a pizza before going in and knocking out, you know. Good God. My life or something, you know, <laughs> just like, what? You know, but that's that. And that's the thing. 
you know, you and I would be like, oh, you know, we're going to have a little tea before our performance, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and these people who are virtuosos and who have basically a gift, they're just like, you know, fuck it. You know, I can do this shit just waking up. Yeah, like yeah, they, exactly. When they get into uh, their like like late 40s, 50s or something, then they start to realize some of them need to like, oh, well, now I'll do a regime. And But yeah, sure. when you don't need to, yeah. you don't need to. When you're 18, yeah. Yeah. They're just, they're just killing it every minute. That's amazing. And it's, yeah. All right. That, yeah. So you get, you're at Sigma, but you start doing freelance stuff at other studios because you're the guy who knows how to run things. So mm. on one of these sessions, you meet uh, Devante at a Chung King session. I'm skipping through because I know you don't want to be on here for nine yeah. hours like everybody else. Yeah, so yeah. you meet Devante, yeah, who then, that leads you to Puff Daddy, who's just about to start Bad Boy Records. Or has maybe already started, but it it's just kicking off, right? No, no. he's He just got hired to Uptown Records. Oh, so this by, is pre uh, on Andre Harrell. Okay. Yeah. Andre Harrell hired him at Uptown right out of college. And, you know, I I, I can't say I excuse me. I don't know if it was the first time Puff had been to the studio, but it was one of the first times Puff had been to the studio. And I was working with D Devante and and Puff had hired him. To, to produce a duet with with um, Mary and and KC from from uh, uh, from Jodeci. and and I was engineering uh, we Devonte and I used to work on a lot of things and we would book two rooms at a time and have a lot of shit going on and we I don't know we were in one of the small rooms at, at Hit Factory on, on this was Hit Factory on 42nd Street right. Um, which was awesome. And this is but, right about um, the same time I was there then. This is like 91, 92. Um, that, that occasion would have been 90. Yeah. 90, 91. Right. Uh, yeah. 90, 91, I think. And then, uh, yeah. And then I, no, I didn't think anything of it, you know, I, cause you, I don't know if it, it happened to you, but I never knew who the fucking boss was. There, there wasn't really. I mean, I knew Devante was my boss, right, at the time. But but he know, just gives Andre you a call Harrell, and says, "Let's go here, do this." Well, what studio do you want to work at? You know, I'd call him studio manager for him. This is what we need. You know, blah blah blah. And um, sometimes I get these gigs because the studio managers just knew that I knew how to use electronic gear and the studio managers would call me. But in this case, I'm working for Devante because um, uh, Prince Charles Alexander hooked me up. Yes, I think that was that was how I got started with with the anyway. Puffy shows up one of his first sessions and I, I don't know if it was then or some other occasion, he somehow got my number and, and um, he called me up and he, and, and he said, you know, I, I, I have a, I'm starting an album and I want you to, I want you to work on it. And, um, and I was just, you know, it was like Christmas, maybe it was Christmas 90, uh, 90, I don't know if it was Christmas 90 or 91. And I was like, you know, I'm just leaving town, man. I'm really sorry. You know, hit me up. I'll be back in town on the second or third or whatever it was. I was coming back. And, um, he was like, Oh man, I really wanted you to do this. And I was like, look, I'd love to do it, but I'm, I'm splitting town for the holidays. He's like, all right, good luck. Take care blah, blah, blah. I swear to God, I'm coming up the stairs in my apartment on Fifth Avenue, Fifth Fifth Street, and uh, and First Ave, and and or maybe it was the Bowery. I can't remember. And uh, I'm coming up the stairs. My phone is ringing because, of course, no cell phones. And and my phone is ringing. And I pick up the phone, and it's Puff. And he's like, "You ready?" 
<laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, sure. He's like, eight o'clock tonight, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I was like, okay, I'll be there. And that's it. That We didn't stop working together for, you know, who knows how long. Was it 10 years? Years, more. yeah. And yeah. you were never, I mean, you were never exclusive, but he just kept you so busy that that was kind of yeah. all you were doing, right? You know, I worked for him a lot. I would do two sessions a day. I would do day sessions and night sessions. But um, I, I would... I would work for him and I, and I would work for people like heavy D and track masters and, um, and Devante, I'd still work for Devante a lot. Um, this band brand Nubian, I would work for them all the time. Um, so yeah, I, w- I would, I would do a lot in those days. And part of it was again, and I've, I've said this in other sessions, you know, dudes didn't want to work for these guys. They didn't want to work either. There was a racist thing or it was, they didn't believe that electronic music was music or right. whatever the fuck. I, I didn't really try to figure it out, but there was a, there was pushback and, and there are a few dudes who, who did it. Prince Charles, even though he was a musician, he engineered a bunch. And um, there were a couple guys, I forget their names, who, you know, but we would we would do the bulk of the R&B hip hop and the early hip hop, I should say, the early hip hop yeah, sessions. Yeah. And, um, but most guys just thought it was bullshit. You know, they thought samples were bullshit. They thought that the music that was being made and rapping was bullshit and, and I thought it was, it, I mean, it, trust me, it was brilliant. I was there. And Devante was fucking amazing musician. And all the musicians that I got a chance to work with. I mean, you put these dudes up against anybody, they'll pick up any instrument as well. Right. You know? I mean, just because they worked a turntable didn't mean that they weren't musicians. You know? They could play. They were the guys who were taking the violin lessons and playing in church and they were those guys as well you know right um they just they just started playing a sampler you know and doing it really well um so there were some amazing musicians that that people were and innovating really innovating too absolutely absolutely i mean the stuff that those guys were doing was they definitely pushed me to the limit as far as my musical ability and i went to berkeley so right they were they were definitely pushing limits right and also i I mean it it's not as unobvious as their musicianship but the vocal arrangements on these things Mm. you you know mary's records and stuff it's insane it's so meticulous and great and not only the performances but the sound and whether or not the lead singer was going to sing the backgrounds or not and everything about it is really clever and thought out none of it's by accident no, no. The, I mean, trust me, there were plenty of accidents yeah. um, wow. and, 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 and plenty of, 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 of genius things that came out of, of various sessions. I remember a session where I was working with Devante and we were editing and trying to make a long version of a song. And, and, you know, he was like, I need to put some time in. He was like, grab some of that stuff in the garbage can. I mean, literally tape just that I had, you know, spooled off from a different section of the song. He's like, yeah, let's put that shit in there. And we cut that shit up to a place now where you would use stutter edit to make that happen, you know? (laughs) But that was in his head, not mine. He's the one who did it. I just executed it. Um, And uh, so, yeah, there was some brilliant shit going on. Man, so so that period, I mean, that's Busta Rhymes, Notorious B.I.G., all the Mary J. Blige stuff. But also... yeah. Well, I was just going to say, in amongst that, at the same time period, you've also got David Bowie credits floating around. So, was this remixes, or were you working on Bowie records? No, I, I, um, I was a big Bowie fan, and my manager, uh, through somebody else, had hooked up with with Bowie's manager, Bill Zisblad, I think was his name, and my manager Duffy Mockery 
connected with him and was like, hey, you know, Tony loves Steve. <laughs> Is there anything that he can do? And David was like, have you ever met? Did you have no, you ever met? No, David? never had the pleasure, Dude. but I've never heard a bad word. Oh my God, what a nice guy. Con considering the level at which, dude, I mean, not to mention popular culture icon, forget about the music, but just the popular cult pop culture icon. Anyway, but um, so Duffy got me, you know, some remixes of stuff he was doing at the time. And, um, and my, I was, I was doing some production. I was trying to break into production. And my partner at the time, this guy Bob Holmes, came out of the sort of punk era uh, with a band named uh, Rubber Rodeo. And so we were doing some stuff together. And we did, we did at least one of the Bowies together. Um, and we were just having fun. We were just making long versions of Bowie songs. <laughs> Dude, you know, yeah. I don't know what we were doing. It was... I was just happy that David Bowie would call me on the phone and be like, I like this, like, do that some more or something like that. You know? Right. Um, Amazing. So that, that was plenty fine with me. And he would send me Christmas cards, you know, right. <laughs> I, that, that's it. That's all I needed. You that's know, amazing. I, but I, I love that. I, I mean, you're, you're steeped in this incredibly vibrant and exploding scene, but you still are chasing like one work with Bowie. You know, and you yeah. must have felt like, you know, maybe I've got the credits. Like, fine, let's find out about that and let's try and do that. And Yeah. Because yeah. I'm sure and you could have used some innovative... sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he, I, I think, too, you know, we we all have our, our heroes. And and somebody like him, I, I any opportunity to just mess with his stuff. You know, I, I did, I did a, I did one of my mixes I did on ADAT, like four ADATs to link together. You know, they used to have that yeah. linking thing. Of course, the black faces sound better than the newer ones, you know, but. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to know, well, first of all, there's a great description of your mix style at this point because first of all you also decided you were going to mix and i'm assuming it was slightly because it wasn't a traditional recording scene that you were a part of anyway so the mixing like you had to be mixing it otherwise what were you doing you were just kind of helping put it together and someone else would mix it didn't make a lot of sense necessarily mm. but so mix magazine described your mixes as outhouse on the bottom and penthouse on top <laughs> I never said that. No, 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 no. Mix who, Magazine did. Yeah, Mix Magazine did. And this is different. this is around the same time. This is kind of like mid mid nineties kind of thing, I think, when when they said that. Some yeah. or maybe a little later. But like what's did you have any sort of ideas about how you wanted to make this stuff sound, or were you just always reacting to what's there? Because obviously with the samples, the low end could be anything and the top end could be anything. So it's not like I've got my rock thing and I like the kick to do this and the bass to do that. There might be 14 kicks and no bass. So how did you, is it just what you heard or did you make a decision about kind of how you wanted stuff to be? Well, you know, Full Force kind of started me out on the idea of how, what the parameters, you know, with every genre, there are parameters and you push on the parameters here and there, but generally, you know, you know, a hip hop or R and B record had to have a, a, a fair bit of bottom end and it had to be punchy. Um, and, you know, with the full force guys, those guys were pre hip hop. So there are lots of vocals. So I got really good at mixing vocals and I had to get really good at mixing bottom. And I would, that's where I started malting kicks and snares um, so that I would separate the frequencies. So I'd separate bottom and to top to mid and top so that I could create a kick that had a nice big bottom 
but also had a punch in the center, you know, um, and, and obviously paying super close attention to phase and all of these important things. That's where I started doing that. And then of course, when you start getting into samples, you start to deal with the fact that, and again, we're on tape. We're not, we're, I can't look at a sample yeah. on tape. So when you're, when you've got samples, they're not all lined up, you know, especially in those days. I mean, there would be drift. There would just be bad programming, bad editing of the sample. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have four or five kicks and they'd all be off. So I would spend time resampling the kicks, re-triggering that kick, of course, making sure that the sound didn't change. Right. There, there was a, an extreme amount of effort that went into this work, whereas now I could do that in three seconds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But back then, it was a lot to get, you know, five kicks to line up so that they didn't, cancel each other out every four bars or whatever was right. happening that was problematic. Um, so that's really where that came from is that I had a lot of experience and, and, you know, I was hired by, by Puff and Devante to work on records that were hip hop records, but they had, they had singing on them. I yeah. mean, that was a new thing. And that was the thing that, that Puff created. And and his contemporaries. That's what they created. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. We we gotta move over to the computer at some point. Anytime you um, want. But that was the thing that he and his contemporaries made. They created hip hop that wasn't just rap, that had had singing on it. And that was that comb combination that, that they created. And so that required me to to even go further and make shit sound hard in the rap kind of way right but get get those vocals to be you know carrying on top of a really hard beat right and, right and so that's that's where that because i suppose in a way that. if you didn't sort of overemphasize the rap element down there then it just feels like another r&b record which is it could not be it had to correct. be this new thing yeah right correct wow yeah um, yeah, it had to be that. So to transition us into the kind of middle career bit or whatever, you work with Destiny's Child. Did that lead you to your incredibly long run with... Uh, oh, we're gone again. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, I think I think we should try to move to Do you the want to go to the computer? Somewhere. No problem. Just zoom on so in the on the computer. Phone, and the, Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can figure this out. Uh Okay, let me see if I can get this to work here. There we go. Yes. We can also just talk a little bit talk about little bit some about stuff on. Oh, stuff on. there you go. Kill the phone. And then turn on that video and we'll be all good. Turn on that. How does that look? That's excellent. Great. That is fantastic. Nice. Um, the so the transition. You know, I don't. I don't know. I think, you know, we talked a little bit about the transition from mixing from recordist to mixing too, or recordists in those days was also mixers sometimes. Um, I mean, I would record for Puff and Trackmasters and Heavy and Brand Nubian and. And I would record for all these guys and mix sometimes. Um, um, but I think the transition to doing more mixing was conscious because recording machines could be fun if you were with people who were uh, fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, but sometimes just, you know, setting up the output of an MPC-60 is not that much fun. No, not the 12,000th time. Yeah, and, 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 then, and then also sometimes recording overdubs, just recording vocals. It's okay. 
But there's a lot of sitting around and waiting for people to show up, if they show up at all. And, you know, that's not that much fun. And, and mixing in those days was on tape. So it wasn't like I was like nowadays, I receive a file that's half mixed by the producer. And right. I'm adding to it and I'm, I'm, I'm giving, you know, creating more headroom and those kinds of things. But in those days, it was a blank slate. And, and so it was a lot of fun. And, um, and, and I made those, those transitions consciously also because it was financial. Uh, I made more money, you know, mixing a record than I did recording. And, um, and I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, break into getting royalties and, and, and I wanted to break into, um, you know, making records with artists that, that, uh, that were willing to give me royalties, you know? And, and I think that that meant I had to work with younger artists. I mean, Puff was not going to give me royalties. He never did. Right. And, um, so I had to find ways to figure it out, you know, and, some some folks did. Tony Dofat gave me royalties on something, and um, but Trackmasters never did, and and even it wasn't for me not asking. I, I asked all the time, um, but you know, I mean, in those days it was it was time consuming. Working on those records was very very time consuming. Right. Um, and y'all in the in the rock world were. You guys were getting royalties. Why? Well, who guys? Not, <laughs> not me, guys. Well, I mean, the guys in New York yeah. that I remember, who were, you know, they were recording and doing overdubs and mixing, and of course, some some of them were co-producing, but you know, they wouldn't get as much money in in that process, but they would get a royalty, right? Um, whereas guys like Clear Mountain were doing both; they were getting a good fee and they were getting royalties um so i think that's probably the business model that i was hoping to get to at some point um but uh the destiny child thing kind of came up because uh teresa love up era whites was uh a young a and r person at columbia and she hired me to to mix um jessica simpson right and uh and and that record did really well that first jesse record and um and um she was nice enough to hire me uh quite a bit after that destiny child was one of those records right and and that got me in touch with b and, and obviously led to quite the relationship because i mean you've been working with her ever since right? yeah 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 oh yeah um, so very, very good relationship and really super creative as well. Right. You know, I mean, I'm sure you, you feel this way as well. It's at some point, you know, your career gets to a place where just everyone that you work with is fucking super talented. <laughs> it's a rare day that you are working with somebody who's just not talented and not super creative hello hi oh is it family times there there's there's andrew there's mara and alethea <laughs> and the internet <laughs> how are you doing uh where are we at one one fifteen or so huh um yeah, maybe another 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, you want to take a drink of water? I've got some water. Thank okay. you. Okay. That's so Hi nice. To All right. Hi to Andrew. <laughs> Hi back. Thanks, Mara and Alethea. All right. Well, look, we, we'll, so, we're we basically going to almost sort of wrap up then because I don't want to keep you too long. But there's there are two sort of concepts. And I mean, because you move to L.A., you start – getting nominated for tons and tons of Grammys, winning some of them, definitely, but nominated for a ridiculous number of Grammys. And you're up against yourself, 
more than once. Like, you know, <laughs> that's working out okay. But I wanted to get to a couple things because I think people would be interested in it. You you described sort of managing your own career in your head as you've got to manage your career as a business. I mean, obviously making records is a weird business to be in. As you've described, it doesn't even occur to you it is a business when you're outside of it. But you've talked about the idea of setting business goals that like, you know, they're work goals, but they're business goals. And then if you don't get to them, you kind of reassess and like, all right, now it's time to kind of reattack or shift things a little bit. And I'm curious if there's anything like specific you can think of where you'd said, look, I got to give myself this much time to do this. And if it didn't happen, you making decisions sort of based on that, or if you managed to kind of meet the goals because you set them in the first place and you've stayed on track. You know, um, we're not using these anymore, right? Okay. I don't know. You tell me. I'm not, uh, I'm not privy to your, your audio setup there, Tony. Um, you know, it's a it's a really important thing, I think, for for anyone who wants to be in, in the music business or any creative field to remember that most businesses, they analyze their progress on a quarterly basis and they do it both via, you know, the number of of. Um, 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 you know, invoices they get uh, if you're a manufacturer or, you know, or the number of dollars you get in um, or the number of prospects you have, right? That's the way things are thought of in business. And I, I would assess at all times. I mean, when I moved to New York City, I was like, I'm, I'm going to give this shit two years. And if this ain't happening, I'm out. I'm going back to family and New England, where I, I, I still love. Pick up the um, hockey stick again, and that's right. Yeah, <laughs> get on the pond. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I gave myself goals and 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 you know markers that I want. I first thing I wanted was I wanted to hear something I worked on on the radio within two years, and I did. And so that kept me going. And then I wanted to work with, you know, some artist that I thought was, you know, significant enough. And I did. I worked with James Brown. And then, you know what I mean? So right. these things kind of luckily kept happening. And then, and then I was like, you know, when I got my first manager, Duffy, uh, I, I mean, I had a couple people who said they were my manager for 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 a couple of years, but they really weren't. But when I actually got a real manager, you know, I said to her, "I want I want an increase in my my revenue by twenty percent. That's that's what I need you to do. If you don't do that, we're done. Never signed a contract at all. We were together for eighteen years, right? And you know, she increased my revenue. You know, she doubled it. Um, so, you know, great. Okay. You know, so, and then as time went on, I started looking at it and thinking about it both creatively as well as financially and, and as a business. So I would think, you know, when it comes to like Black Eyed Peas, you know, I just, I, I like their first record. And, and I said to Duffy, can I get in on this? Can you figure this out, you know? And so she reached out to um, to Ron Fair. And I think Dave Pensado was also a part of that. He, he was right. nice enough to, to uh, you, know, uh, you know, give me a thumbs up um, in the process. I'm assuming that Ron Fair asked Dave, hey, do you know this guy and blah, 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 you know? Um, so, so, uh, you know, I did, I made conscious effort. Well, I think it's a really people. important thing because first of all, it means you are assessing things, but it's also, it's giving yourself achievable goals that you can measure as opposed to, yeah. I just want to make it in the music business. Like, well, what does that right. even mean? I don't feel like I've made it. And compared to a lot of people, I absolutely have. Like you're never done making it. But yeah. if you can have a goal that's short-term and realistic, 
then you can actually assess what's going on and not delude yourself into thinking either you're doing better than you are or worse than you are and getting all down in yourself when if you have goals like that it can really help i'm gonna just make a we're gonna do a part two at some point so we'll pick up at destiny's child because there's so much other stuff i think we should talk about if you're cool with that so so we'll just do like a couple little concept things have a couple of questions and let you out of here but i want to talk about the idea of the production company because you said mm -hmm. that that they told you not told you they taught you what a production company was like full force really early on yeah. in your career and you have a production company you've got mirror ball which you started in mm -hmm. 2011 right after you moved to la yeah and that's a concept like for me i've always like i work on my own and i'm scared to ever be have people responsible or dependent upon me and things like that but you have you love the idea of a team and everybody working together and bolstering each other. So you want to just speak to that for a little bit and then we'll have Mark give us a couple of questions and we'll schedule round two for yeah. another time. Um, you know, I, I, be, again, part, part of this comes directly from full force I mean, the six dudes, you know, I mean, they tag team me as an engineer. I, I'd, I'd be the only one sitting in the room all, the whole day, you know, those guys would tag team. So-and-so would come in and put a musical part on. Some, somebody else would come in and put a rhythmic part on. Somebody else would, you know, do vocals. And they're, they're tag teaming. But they always seem to be knowing exactly what the other was going to do or, you know, feeding off each other so that it kept going better and better and better. Um and similarly with Puff's camp, I mean, Puff was not a musician. So he not so much delegated, he creatively communicated and, 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 and staged his, his process um, in a way where he pulled somebody in who had a particular craft, you know, a, uh, uh, was was amazing at a particular thing and then he'd pull other people in to do other things um and um you know me being technical it's it's a little different and so when i came i mean before i came to la i, I mostly worked in commercial studios and it's a lot di more difficult to do that because the studio hires the assistant they hired the whole staff um, for me to pull anybody else into it is always a little awkward. Right. Um, you know, so when I came to L.A., I immediately started building a team. And this is on the engineering side. The production side, I, I started doing a little bit of that and building that. But my engineering team was really much more powerful and much more, you know, what I am and what I do. I'm much more of an engineer than I am a producer. Um, but the team started growing in a really interesting and sort of, um, you know, organic way. I mean, just because, you know, this guy pulls in this guy and that guy pulls in that guy. And it got to a place where, you know, I would hire assistants basically I would, you know, sort of field three or four or five people and, you know, I would choose maybe one or two that I thought were the good guys. And then I would let the team pick who was going to enter. And because as one person graduated, another guy, you know, I needed to always keep a younger person on the team to, to grow into it because it does take a long time for me to, have an assistant that I trust. Right. I would say it takes as much as three years, you know, and I would require the new person to stay at least two years. Um, and only one guy stayed w only just the two years. Right. Everyone else was with me for probably three and four years. Um, so, um, and that, that was a process that, I didn't ever think about it much more than as it happened, you know, and, and now it's become a really great position for me because, you know, I just did a record with Debbie Nova or I, I did it 
last year and it came out this year, but you know, she didn't have a large budget. So I introduced her to the senior guys on my team and they jumped in and, and did six of the mixes. Right. And mm-hmm. I, you know, kind of tweaked their mixes and I gave them comments and I, you know, I touched it for a few hours but they got credit. They got paid. Yeah, but proper executive you know? production. And um, I and I got my four or five mixes, you know, that I did by myself. And she was able to make this happen in her budget. Um, and and I'm very happy with the whole record. Um, right. And we were able to do that all in house. She came to the studio. We did comments and and went through the whole record several times, and it was a great experience. Um, And, um, you know, that's worked, uh, I would say, 70% of the time. And the other 30% of the time, it didn't work. You know, it either fell apart because the producer wanted me to sit there on every song. Right. And they just didn't have the dough for me to do that. And then... Either that or the, the people who put it together didn't tell the, the, the artist that that's the way it was going right. to work. I don't know. But that's, that's the only problem. Well, it's with great. It. It, it's, a, it's a huge kind of support network for you as well. But it's it also it's mentoring for them. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's great. It's a real great symbiotic relationship. So, yeah. All right. I'm not going to ask you about any other records because we haven't mentioned Jason Mraz. We haven't mentioned... <gasps> all yeah. kinds of so many things we haven't mentioned that we yeah. will just come back but i just wanted to mention two quick things that were on your well even just one one thing on your your playlists which are awesome by the way is one mm. thing which is mm. such a great track a great great track but i wanted to mention it because yeah. on your inspiration playlist you've got a hosier track and hosier did a fantastic cover of one thing that he did only for TV, I think. I don't know that they ever bothered recording it, but it's such a great track. Yeah. It's so good. You know, that that one thing track, I because Marn and I were talking about putting when we were putting together the playlist, and she was like, oh, this one thing track, you know, it's pretty old, whatever, whatever. And I was like, that's just one of those tracks that everybody says, you did that? Oh, yeah. shit. You know, that was my summer whatever you know yeah that was this moment or or you know but i actually i, I work with a marie on on two records that being her biggest hit um and rich harrison and i we <laughs> i was working on uh, my life i was mixing my life for mary j and we were working at the hip factory and uh Eddie Germano and Tommy Mottola were friends. And um, Rich Harrison had just signed a pub deal or something with Sony, Tommy. And, and, and I was working in this room, not using the live space. So Rich Harrison made a deal. So Tommy made a deal with, with Eddie Germano. So Rich would work in my live room. And he would just be in there writing tracks and hanging out. And so Rich Harris and I became really close to this day, still very close friends. We did Crazy in Love together, of course, too. But so Amory was one of his first records. Right. And he and I had become friends. And he was like, dude, you want to do this record with me? And I was like, sure, of course, man. And I think we did that record at, at right, not at right track, at soundtrack on 21st, I think it was. And, uh, and you know, that record was so weird. It just, it, it, it had the go-go thing going on that nobody had done. And I was not sure what to do. And in the end, because I couldn't follow all my usual rules of hip hop, you know, the parameters that, I'm, that right. I was, was dealing with that record didn't fit any of the parameters. So I was like, I I don't know what I'm doing here. And Rich, you, again, he and I become very close, but he was just perfect and would always pick up. No, the snare needs to be right here. 
And I'd be like, okay, what about, you know, is a vocal need reverb, delay? No, nope, just a little delay, blah, blah, blah. You know, this kind of thing. And, and, um, and, and it's one of the records I'm most proud of because. It's amazing. I, it's, it, it's so I'm, good. It's yeah, so good. And right. the drums are so like present that yeah. you forget they're a sample, except that every single bar they glitch as they yeah. turn. And it's That's so right. funky because they glitch. Yeah. It's, it's just brilliant. incredible. Absolutely incredible. And another one I wanted to mention only, I mean, I was going to mention it anyway, but uh, Fantasy, which is just, mm. it's a great, the fact that it's a collaboration between Mariah and Old Dirty Bastard, but it's built on the Tom Tom Club sample that was getting recorded yeah. in the room by Glenn or worked on in the other by room Glenn. That, that's so me. back to the beginning of your career, that's Genius right. in Love is all over yeah. that that track. But yeah. yeah, you gotta talk just just a couple minutes on that track because we'll come back another time and talk about blurred lines and fits in the tantrums and blah blah yeah, blah. Yeah. But let's hear just a tiny bit about that because I that that those are not two names you would expect to hear. Okay, this this is this the epic shit. You have these in your life, I know, but this is the epic shit that 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 make you like, you know, if 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 I. If somebody said you can't work anymore tomorrow, I'd be like, "That's cool. I I, I got all this epic <laughs> shit. I'm, I'm I'm really good, you know. I, I just as long as I got some pasta, I'm I'm gonna be okay, you know." Um, so me and Puff are by at this point, by this point, Puff and I are we're soaring, you know. We're making hit records every month. You know, yeah, huge. Every huge. record owned, is, is, owned it, yeah, and owned MTV, killing. which was a big deal. Big, yeah, big deal. Yeah, we are killing it, and we don't. Again, you know, I'm not pumping us up. We don't. We don't know who we are. Puff, Puff is still. He's not the mogul. He's the the kid sleeping on the couch while I'm fucking mixing. You know what I mean? I'm the kid trying to stuff food in my mouth so I don't collapse or sleeping under the console while my assistant is punching in. You know, we're not we're not celebrities. We don't even know that the work we're doing is going to be amazing. We're just trying to make a living. So there's nothing about this that's, you know, glamorous by any stretch other than the fact that, you know, you get to work at fucking pretty nice studios yeah. back then. Anyway, so Hit Factory, the the new, at that time, the new Hit Factory on yep. 54th and 10th it is not that old at that point, you know. And I I have to say, I'm not sure I had worked in the big room. Do you, had you ever been in the big room? Yeah, well, because I was there for six months on a Michael Jackson record. So we were the ones oh. who had all four rooms booked for like a month, you know. Right. That's the, yeah, that's yeah, it was big, that ridiculous. Was a, that's a story in and of itself. Yeah. But, but yes, that, that studio, I don't even remember big, studio one. So that was one. Yeah. Oh. Upstairs, the really big tracking room, beautiful orchestral Huge. room. Yeah. Gigantic. Yes. Gigantic room. I don't think I had ever worked in that room. If I uh, maybe once, I don't remember anyway. I, and I had never worked with Mariah and I thought she was amazing. I mean, she was an incredible singer. You know, she was a writer and everything. Um, and and of course, I knew who Tommy was. I'd never worked for him. But Tommy was waiting at the door when I when I got off that big, you know, that big giant elevator. Yeah, the freight elevator. Off, yeah, the freight the freight elevator that they made nice. And and literally, Tommy Matola is at the door as I open the door and. And, and I was, of course, not. now I'm like, oh, fuck, you know, I'm scared to death. I'm like sweating. Tommy Matola's here. I, you know, you don't even realize like that's his wife. Yeah. You know, those things as, as a kid making records every day, you know, the celebrity part of it was not part of my life. And it wasn't even part of Puff's life at that point yet, you know. So there's Tommy, and and he's like, "Hi, I'm Tommy. I'm hi, I'm Tony." <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh, oh, you geez. Italian too? Yeah. <laughs> I, we didn't get there. We we don't need to ask that question. But yeah. 
you know, I'm like scared to death at this point. You know, I'm in the biggest room. You know, I, I had seen maybe a RCA was that big. And and I witnessed that, you know, going getting closed. And, and there were a couple rooms I had seen that were that big. But I had never really worked in one because I did hip yeah. hop. You know, we didn't need big rooms like that. And the control room was bigger than most of the live rooms I had ever worked in, you know? The lounge was bigger yeah. than most live rooms I ever worked in. So anyway, uh, Tommy's at the door my first day. You know, it's Germano Studios. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I'm scared to death of of Eddie. You know, Eddie was a formidable figure. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and uh and so I'm pretty fucking nervous, to say the least, you know? But I got my tie on, bro. Well done. I got my tie on. Well done. So I got, I got my shirt sleeves with my tie on. Dressed for work. And and in those days, that's that's how I dressed. And um, so that, that because it was a remix, that went on. That fantasy record, I mean, that had to be a two-week thing, you know? of getting that all done. I didn't record Mariah because she had, I think Dana LaChapelle was her recordist right. at the time. And, um, but I was lucky enough to get her vocals separated, which she would never do that. I, I had to push for that. It was really difficult, but they allowed me to have her vocals separated. You know, I don't think it was all separated. Like there was at least some stereo patches. Right. Right, as opposed right. to just a stereo of everything with the reverb, which she would do that sometimes. Um, but anyway, it was a two week thing and it went on and it was a long thing. Uh, I have no idea how much it cost, but, um, but ODB, I mean, I had been a big fan of his as well. And of course he didn't, uh, he didn't disappoint, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, I don't even know. I, I'm trying to think if I met Mariah at that session, because I worked with her later and met her several times. But I can't remember. I was just so fucking nervous <laughs> the whole time. Because we recorded all this stuff. And of course, I remember the Tom Tom Club sample. And yeah. Stanley had, I think Stephen Stanley had mixed that original one. But, um, uh, you know, so I was nervous about that. And, and I had to manipulate that sample. So there's, I was nervous about pretty much everything. I was nervous <laughs> about what the implications were of the sample. Because in those days, of course, clearing the sample was a big deal. Yeah. And, and the implications of how it was used and all of those kinds of things went into it. Plus there's, there's, you know, a producer or several, including Puff, who were adding instruments to it and, you know, and then scheduling B ODB was not that you don't just schedule ODB. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's just, he didn't, there was no schedule. It was like ODB is going to be here in 10, you know, Right. Uh, so this whole thing was, uh, was, was, I, and I can't re really remember how long it was. And part of the reason why I can't remember is because I was so freaked out and nervous. That's Puff, on the other hand, was cool as a fucking cucumber. And I don't know how he did that. I swear to God, because this was definitely one of the biggest things that we had ever, or at least name wise. Yeah. And, you know, at the level of having Tommy being there and part of it, it was a big deal. And I yeah. was freaking well, out. Well, I mean, it legitimizes the the whole genre, really. I mean, that's not legitimizes think, like it needed legitimize. I don't want to. That sounds no, almost no, disparaging, but it mainstreams the genre. It's it like, did. oh, you're taking over the world. We'll own that now. But yeah, bring it into the fold. So for Sony in the person of Tommy to be there that's yeah. huge huge it was huge i think the thing that that connected things for me and it made it a little bit easier there's this guy uh do you remember that there was a group called the fat boys 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there was uh, Mark Morales was one of the main guys. He was also the producer. His buddy and co-producer, uh, Corey Rooney, I had worked with on Mark Morales's record. And Corey Rooney was getting tight with Tommy. So there was this whole, I was accepted partly and probably mostly because of Corey and Mark. And then, of course, because Puff insisted, because I don't think they wanted, I don't think originally, you know, probably they, um, Dana or yeah. somebody like Dana or maybe Mick Kozowski because Mick and Tommy. Mick was were mixing tight. everything for Tommy then. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's possible that I only got that gig because of Corey and, and Puff kind of pushing and Mark pushing for me. Um, and thank you if you're watching right now, <laughs> because, because I still consider that to be one, one of the most amazing records that I've made and most fun, you know, um, for all the nervousness that I felt, it was still fucking awesome yeah and it's good. it's still a jam that and one thing both just still come flying out of the speakers when they come yeah. on amazing all yeah. right i'm gonna ask you one little question while mark comes on to give us a couple of questions and then then we'll let you go for now but you mm. are coming back because i know where you live um mm. so for odb you set up a 58 um no um i don't know if you remember there was a period of time where you could not take a Sony microphone off of the stand. Yeah, Sony C800G on every single session. And, and an Avalon. Yeah. You, you couldn't take it off because if you didn't, if, if it wasn't there, people would be like, w where's the mic? Yeah. You know? And and so that was that period where that was the mic. I, I probably wanted to use a 67 on on somebody like ODB, but uh, whatever, man. Wasn't gonna was happen, so, man. I was so nervous. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just help, hoping he's gonna do his thing. Right. You know? so, right. Awesome. Well, Mark, yeah. come on in and let's uh, let's wrap this up. But there is absolutely a part two because we didn't talk about anything really. <laughs> wow. I mean, we did, but the the list of stuff that we haven't talked about, I mean, blurred lines, we could do four hours just on that. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm so, for real. Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll come back to all that in in a few weeks if that's cool. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. Right. I'm good. I I'm not going anywhere. All right. I don't leave the yeah. compound. The gate hasn't been open in four days. Good, good. Yeah, and it still says dogs on patrol. I haven't touched anything, Good. man, aside from what the insurance company made me trim. <laughs> Although I do have a garden. I get tomatoes and, nice. and some cucumbers. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, let's see. We have a whole bunch of questions. but And just uh, so you know, we are at 2 hours 15, pal. So I kept you on here. Nice. It's so, good. you know. It's good. I, I'm, I knew I wasn't going to break any records. Well, we could though. If if you didn't have yeah. a whole family and things, we'd be here till yeah, midnight your time. But yeah, no, 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 all good, all good. But we will we will come back and do part two. Please. Yeah. Um, okay. So our first one, which is the most upvoted question, uh, we're on a platform called Crowdcast where people can upvote other people's questions and stuff. So everybody voted for this one, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, if you could remix any mix, what mix would you choose and why? Oh, you know, I think about this all the time. Really? There's too many. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll listen to, uh, oh, God. Um, well, now, is, yeah. this, is this your own stuff or just you oh, wish oh, you would mix yeah, someone yeah. else's my, stuff? Are we talking about my work or... Or somebody else's work. I think so, but it does say any mix. So, <laughs> oh, well, let's stick with with your own. Yeah, work. with with my stuff, I, I have to say there there are a lot of records <laughs> that I mixed in rooms that I didn't know. I mean, in those days, you know, I would try to pick rooms that I knew. 
-hmm. You know, there was Chung King. There was a room at Chung King. There were two rooms at Hip Factory. There was, um, I, you know, I don't even remember. Oh, Skyline. There were a couple, you know, there were rooms in the city that I that I knew and loved. But there were a couple rooms that I I just sucked in. I just sucked in. And if, if the client, if that was the only room the client could get, and that was a room I was in, was was a room that that I just and I call I say I sucked in it because there are other mixers who got great mixes, but there there were there were mixes that I did and and you know uh, that didn't didn't work out. They just didn't work out. And and one that doesn't apply to to that theory of the room is uh, Jason Mraz's. Um, love record mm -hmm. chicarelli produced great record i think i was i was in transition um in my room i had i hadn't found the, the sweet spot in the in my commercial room over in north hollywood mm -hmm. i hadn't found the sweet spot yet and and it, i just i hate the fucking record I, I don't hate the songs but i hate my mixes and i hope I hope Joe doesn't hate him as much as I do. Has he and hired you Jason, since? You no, know, he hasn't. Ah, oh. <laughs> wow. But, we'll, get, we'll get Joe on and then we can sort that yeah. out. <laughs> but I feel bad because I love both of those humans a lot. And, and of course, uh, the work is, was amazing. But, but I, my mixes... I, I, every time I hear that record, I'm like, oh. Well, I got to say, Jack made a really interesting point last week about mixers where when you're mixing, you have to be at the absolute top of your game all day, every yeah. single day. That's right. Whereas while you're tracking, there are always days during a session which are unproductive or like you come back the next day and have a listen like, man, that guitar sound's not going to cut it. Let's redo it again, whatever. Yeah. And there's, there's no real do-over. I mean, there's more now. But it's not a do-over. It's just endless cycles of, of notes. But you never really just like, all right, fader's down. That sucked. Let's exactly. do it again. No, that's absolutely correct. It's so it's, it's hard. Uh, yeah. And, and, and you don't get a do-over, unfortunately, um, very often. Uh, I, I, I've been lucky a couple times where I've, I've said to my client, and, and I probably even said it to Joe at that time, like, I'm not liking what I'm doing. I'm, I need to pull this up again. You know, I need to do something else. And, and I don't know that I hit it. Um, a couple of them I might have gotten right, but otherwise I think I missed a couple. Um, but um, there, there were a fair, a fair bit of the early records that I did. You know, I, you know one of my... One of my favorite mixers is Michael Brower, who has become a friend in, through the years. And one of the reasons why I like him as a mixer is that motherfucker is consistent. Mm. There, there are very few records you can listen to that Michael did that you say, oh, that, that's not working, you know, right. or that yeah. that's just not good. Or, mm. and, and I can, you know, I can't think of them off the top of my head right now. And I'm sorry for the people who, ask the question but there are a lot of records i made that i like oh my god that that mix is horrible i remember the studio you know the the calibration don't forget we used to calibrate yeah. consoles tape machines everything you know there were lots of records that sucked you know <laughs> that just my mix just i was lucky to get it out and and usually they're when it, the the reason why and the way that I say it sucks is it's cloudy. I hate cloudy. Right. And cloudy in a bad way, not not cloudy in an interesting. So that's the kind way. of outhouse on the bottom and outhouse on top. Yeah, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> so I'm not sure that answers the question, but yes, there I are think, a lot. I think it does. I think it does. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm just going to I'm just going to pan over so we can check out squid here because i can do that so there's squid ah uh, nice <laughs> uh, all right squid's down tony i love that that the first record you mentioned um debuted on billboard at number two uh <laughs> and sold as well as it did i think plenty of people like the mixes on that one imagine if i would have really killed it right oh, <laughs> um that's awesome but, 
Great yeah, question. yeah. Michael Brower is the gold standard of consistency, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Serban's pretty damn good with consistency yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, those guys, just every song, you just want to what are they doing? They got like a grinder. They just comes out the other end. Perfect. How do they do that? I don't know. I don't know. I was mixing different speakers, every room, every two sessions a day, different speakers. I, you know, I was like, ah. um, anyway. actually on that topic, the next question that was upvoted the most was, uh, from, uh, the username adder. And he says, Tony, I see you're in what looks like a loft or apex of a house. Can you talk a bit about how you dealt with the acoustics in that room? Are the bass traps behind you all you have in the treatment department? Are you using sonar works? Thanks for your time. Um, these, this room is, is, a, is a large room. It's with, a very with large high room. Ceilings. It, ha it has um, you know, gable sides to it. I guess that's what it's called, gable sides. Um, but it's a garage that the, the, the roof was lifted to the peak. And um, uh, I don't know what the square footage is. It's uh, 22 and a half by 25. There you go. So that's the <laughs> Not that I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and they're, these are all custom uh, made panels. Um, and of course, I'm going to forget his name. John was his first name. I forget his last name. And um, but uh, it's it's not done yet. So I have you can you can see the panels in the back, but I have similar panels on the sides, on on the on the uh, pitched ceiling as well, and on the ceiling above me there are panels, um, and. The panels go from four inches to the back panels are eight inches. Wow. Um, so uh, it changed the room because before the panels were up, I had just sort of done the floor and painted and cleaned things up. And, and it was an echo chamber in here. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the panels went up, it's, it's actually quite a nice sounding room and really um, uh, comfortable uh, sonically. Uh, I need some some tweaking um, um, in the front wall to get a little bit better accuracy, but with with the lockdown and the quarantine, I haven't been able to get anybody in here to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I I hired some folks to come and and uh, straighten it out because I didn't I didn't want to build panels and I didn't want to use off the shelf panels mm -hmm. and I didn't want to build you know a wall. Uh, baffle thing. I wanted it to be something that, yeah, I could take these panels with me if I leave or not. Right. You know? right. Yeah. And for those that don't know, that's a room I was in for 21 years. So, that's right. yeah. And I faced <laughs> almost every direction except the direction that Tony's facing in that room. Yeah. So, right. yeah, it's a surprisingly versatile room, but I think the volume of it and the fact that the ceiling is not flat yeah it makes the room just get out of the way so it's not hard to treat and it's pretty flexible you can kind of make it whatever you want yeah 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 it works out great um do either of you have any thoughts on room tuning um beyond acoustic treatment i don't use any nope. correction software stuff i don't know about you tony nope never have and and in fact just the mention of it freaks me out hmm. um and I think maybe that goes back to room correction shit when I was younger was really horrible. And maybe now it's much better, but I don't, I can't. Yeah, but I mean, it is the kind of thing where most studios, the mains were not for working on, you know, and they would have, but it, you just couldn't do it. And I think for me, it's just having even more processing to what I'm hearing scares me. But yeah, some like, of the, I mean, this it's good and some people swear by it and get great results, but I don't use it. Yeah, same with me. I got, I got, I want to get as clean a signal from my source to my speaker. Yeah, from D to A to speaker has got to be almost nothing, just a volume yep. knob. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Same. Awesome. Uh, do you have time for one more? Sure. Okay. I okay. got to, yeah. That'll be a nice round, round number. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, so this one is from Paul. 
And Paul says, most mixing engineers have that aha moment after being a fledgling for a few years. Uh, when was yours and what was it? Um, well, we should both answer to this because I think it's appropriate. Um, I'm mine just going to show you squid instead. <laughs> Sitting on the neve. <laughs> mine was... Um, You know, I remember when I first got to New York City and the senior guys at Sigma said to me, you know, don't be impatient. It takes seven years to become an, an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck that. I'm fucking going to knock this shit out in a couple <laughs> of years, you know. Um, and I think that that energy that I had was useful, but um, a ways down uh, after that, um, some years later, I was, uh, I was working for Devante, as a matter of fact, and, um, uh, and I had made relationships with a lot of the studio managers, as, as I had said earlier, and it got to a place where even the studio managers, would, I, I was in a session with Devante in one room, and in the other room, there was a big artist. And I can't remember who the artist was right now, but um, you know, they had a, a shit ton of gear in the room, but nobody knew how to make it work. So the studio manager called me up and, he, and, and she was like, look, can you, can you go in there and, and help them out and fix this up? So I went in there and got it all running, locked it to the tape machine. Devante was writing in the other room, so it was cool. And, and this client, you know, says to me, hey, man, can you talk to my manager? And, and uh, I was like, sure, sure. You know, I talked to the manager and he was like, look, I need to hire you to do this, finish this record, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'll finish this thing up and we can do it over the weekend or whatever it was. And, um, and he was like, how much do you charge, you know, for the, for the work and for the mix? And you know, my, my fucking rate was probably like, I don't know, a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks, something like that. And he was like, 1200 bucks, how the hell can you justify blah, 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 and, blah, 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 blah. and he was like all pissed off. And, and I completely calmly said to him, you know, I just came from your room and got your session going, got everything running. You're going to be able to do something. I was like, you don't, I don't need the gig. It's all good. You do your thing, you know? And, and, and he, you know, I don't know if we hung up or he calmed down and immediately he was like, no, 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 no. You know, he did one of those, no, no, no. We really want you to, you know? And I was like, I, I, I get a charge based on what I can do and my experience and my experience allows me to do this. And I've done these records and you can hire me or not. And I think at that moment I was like, okay, not only am I comfortable in the room, but I'm, I'm comfortable enough to, to say to somebody, this is why I, I make this money because I work. And it wasn't a lot of money, but, you know, because I fucking kicked ass and worked hard for the last seven years. And that was probably about the seven year mark mm -hmm. as well. And, and that's when I felt like, okay, I'm an engineer now. Uh, you know. That's so, funny. I've got, I guess, in that similar vein of the sort of feeling empowered in your own career, which is a big deal. And it's like the setting goals we were talking about before. Um, for years, I made money because I was like the fix-it guy. I would come to the studio with my DA88s because I didn't have the ADATs. And I would transfer from any tape machine in sync, take the stuff home, do what needed to be done, and bring it back. And I was tuning tons of vocals, and it was right during the the boy band explosion, you know. And that's mm. I was basically paying my mortgage by tuning vocals because that's the only work I could wow. get. And for the most part, it was okay. I was good at it, and I've got good relative pitch. So like whatever, it was some work. And there was one record I was doing, no idea what it is. It doesn't matter. But when I thought. Like, wow, I'm going to be the reason that this is going to see the light of day. And I hate it. And I actually oh, called up and quit 
and said, sorry, man, something came up, you know, I can't do this. I'm really, so and, you know, offered to make concessions because I had taken the job and I really felt bad about that. But that's when I said, I'm not going to do this for a living anymore. Like this is not, so I didn't set the goal that I was going to stop tuning vocals, but I sort of made the realization that I should have set the goal that I was going to stop yeah. tuning vocals and move on. And I was terrified. We had two kids we were living in that house at that point, mm -hmm. you know, was I going to have to get another job? But I just decided that this was not actually the career I was hoping to have. And it was time to yeah. move it along. And I don't know anybody who's talented who, when they do that, it doesn't work out. Like yeah. you, it, it, but it takes that decision to push yourself to move to the next thing. Cause otherwise it's really easy to say, well, I got some work, I got some tuning to do. And That's right. you know, so yeah. yeah. I think that was my moment of that description. Yeah. So Tony, and when you start thinking of yourself as an engineer, it really helps. You know, it really yeah. does help. Yeah, and it's hard. I mean, because I'm, as I said, I'm the poster child for imposter syndrome. So to have the confidence to say that is tough. It's really, yeah. really tough. But it's yeah. like, look, if I'm wrong, I'll get proved wrong, and then I wasn't ever going to be able to do it anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and that really frees you up for like a minute and then you're terrified again, but it's, it's letting good. go is, is a positive thing sometimes. Yeah. It yeah. Really is. So Tony, we're going to let you go on a nice little turn of phrase segue there. Um, yeah. but yeah. you, you have to do a part two. We've got people lined up for the next several weeks. So I just want to tell everybody yeah. who's here now, uh, that next week is Sylvia Massey, which should oh, be wow. epic. Um, yeah. If you haven't already seen it, because I'm not going to share photos of people, but everybody has to go online and find the picture of Sylvia Massey and Tom Morello standing three feet away from Tool, and they're playing some little tiny club gig. I don't think there's anybody else even in the picture. That's how few people were there. But Sylvia and Tom just looking at Tool going, what the fuck is going on here? It's an amazing amazing yeah. picture so we'll talk about that and more next week and then we'll be back with you in a few weeks if looking forward cool. to it awesome thank you so much all right thanks so much thanks mark thank you yeah. thanks, all right mark. bye everybody